this and that for you. Or then I'm going to get work with Congress and we're going to do bipartisan nonsense. None of that stuff is going to be talked about in our campaign. Our campaign is a living, breathing campaign that involves you, that offers solutions for you on any of these issues. And that's what our campaign is. So we're not going to wait for the corrupt U.S. Congress to do anything or senators are all bought and paid for. All the judges are bought and paid for. And in fact, the presidency itself is bought and paid for. So I want to be very clear. When I'm U.S. president, I know I'm surrounded by the swarm. What will I do with, with the U.S. presidency? Every day, like I do videos here, I will do two videos a day and I will use the bully pulpit of the presidency to use all the knowledge that I've been very, very fortunate to organize to teach people how to take care of themselves, fundamentals. Because you know what? By the time you pass healthcare bills, everyone's gonna die even younger. We're gonna talk about the environment, how you can do stuff, you can do stuff, not wait for some dumbass congressperson do anything. You're gonna learn how to take care of your children's health. You're gonna learn how to think, you're gonna learn how to take care of finances here and now. It's going back to being what America was about. People work in local communities, they use their resourcefulness and they rise to the occasion. This is not about waiting for government to, any, to do anything because they're not going to do anything for you. And let's look at what they have actually done for you. As many of you know, on April 19th, we announced that I'm running for president. It was on that day, historically, on the occasion when Paul Revere, you know, drove through Massachusetts or rode on his horse, warning people what the hell was going to happen. And many of you know, I've been 100% correct. My track record is for everyone to see always calling things two to three to four years ahead of the curve. In some ways, inventing things when people thought it was an impossible, like email or echo mail or cytosol. And I'm able to do that because I'm one of you, I work my butt off, and I believe in the fact that when you work hard, when you set a goal, and you, when you take a systems approach, you can do anything. And that is my intention, to educate you so you stand up on your own two feet. And that is what this campaign is about. If you want to vote for any of these other fools, any one of them who are all just little numb nuts, they're all little mama and papa's boys, they're all little people who were given big, big silver spoons. They never had to work hard. And by the way, they're all one little swarm. You can go look at the swarm video. They all know each other. They all hang out together. They all bang each other. They're one clusterfuck of incestuous assholes. And that's a technical term. And we should use that to refer to them. And if you want to keep thinking booby effing Kennedy is going to do anything, well, this guy comes from Hollywood. He comes from a mafia family. The guy's never worked a day in his life. Trump, come on. Mar-a-Lago, you got to pay him 250K to get, even get in. He's not one of us. Elon Musk, he grew up in South African apartheid with 1% control, 99%. He does not believe in free speech. He'll bullshit you. Tucker Carlson, another bogus guy, all right? He and Hunter Biden were like this. So we live in a very important point in history where they know our movement which is bottoms as is coming up. And we know what we, they know, we know what they know, okay? And what bothers them is they are consolidating the not so obvious establishment to make sure people bow down to them and they don't build a bottoms up movement. And what, what do they want? Well, they want death for you. They literally are killing the American people. Your children are going to die younger than you. And where's the data on that? Well, let's go right to the data, okay? Because it's time that everyone wake the fuck up, okay? And that's also part of, a, that's also a technical term, okay? And why do I say that? Well, look at this graph. What does this graph show you? And this is why I say everyone needs to WTFU. This graph, as I launched our campaign, shows every line here. By the way, let's start it simple so some people don't know how to read graphs. The x-axis goes from 1980 to 2020. Unfortunately, they don't teach this in high school anymore. How do you even read a graph? And then the y-axis is your life expectancy. And this tracks life expectancy of many countries all over the industrialized nations. And it highlights the United States life expectancy and also the, the average of all those countries in that gray line, okay? Everyone see that? Now, what do you see? Starting in 1980, the life expectancy of the US deviates from the international norm of the uh, develop, uh, developed, uh, sorry, industrialized nations. We're going wackadoodle. In fact, starting here, we start going down. So by the time COVID hits, everyone's immune systems has been destroyed. That's what this really represents. What well, you're really looking at the immune system. So when a shock hits, this is what's happened. So this is what I'm saying. If you are a American, your son or daughter is expected to live less than you. I hope everyone gets that clear. And who is responsible for this? 
every one of those other presidential candidates who are running, every politician, every member of Republicans and Democrats, every academic, every lawyer, everyone who's any person of note. Just look at this graph and ask yourself, what the fuck are you doing even thinking about voting for the lesser of two evils? Why are you even questioning? Why don't we vote for Dr. Shiva? Why are you asking stupid questions? Oh, can an independent win? We have no choice because this demands a systems overhaul. And what has caused this? Well, by the way, important you know, point here, if you keep running like Charlie Brown to think, um, you know, uh, in this case, Lucy's not going to take away the football. He, she does it every time. And this is what it is voting for the lesser of two evils. They're going to screw you. OK. And our program, our solution is on all these major issues, healthcare, environment, education, innovation, governance and economy. We actually have a solution and the solutions right there. And these solutions are not based on waiting after I get into the presidency. If you vote for me and I get into the presidency, I'm going to be able to do it sooner. But I'm not waiting. Every Thursday, I take one of these areas and I deliver you a solution. But it demands that you get off your ass and you actually take action. Healthcare. What's our position on healthcare? You have to strengthen your immune system. If you came last Thursday and the, and the sixth Thursday before, I showed you what is the immune system, educated you no different than an education you would get at Harvard Medical School or even better, frankly, Harvard Medical School students don't even know that they should come here. And you were given exact protocols that you can use to strengthen your immune system. That's our healthcare program. Government ain't gonna do anything for you guys. Healthcare costs are ridiculous. You have ridiculous deductibles and they're gonna give you drugs after you get screwed up. So I gave you a practical way and that is our healthcare platform. You don't have to wait until I get elected president. Obviously, if you do, and if you're smart and you galvanize your people to do that, which is what we need you to do. We need you to get your ass off the couch, hands off the keyboards, get on the ground and let people know, hey, there's this guy, Dr. Shiva. He's actually one of us. He's not a Kennedy, he's not a Trump, but he's one of us. And he gave me a solution for healthcare. Now, environment is what we're gonna be talking about today. How do you eat local and healthy foods on a budget? Well, that action of you starting to do that is going to wake you up. Well, what are GMOs? What are organic foods? Why am I not supporting my local farmer? Why am I buying a $3 freaking avocado? Why am I paying $42 or $30 for a pound of you know tenderloin? What the hell is going on? This leads you to the fact that they do want to kill you. Get it through your heads. They want to kill you. Our movement, my candidacy wants to make you live longer and prosper. You have no choice unless you want to be stupid and die early and you want to kill your children sooner. So you will learn that that's our environmental program. Start eating locally and healthy. There is no other program for the environment, period. EPA, they're not going to do anything. Look at the environment. It gets worse and worse and worse. Look at the pollutants. They get worse and worse and worse. Education. What's my program on the education? Well, the Department of Education, we can talk about blowing them up. We can talk about um, bills in Congress. About that, you know, By the time they do that, your children are going to get even more dumber. Well, here, next Thursday, like I did six Thursdays ago, I will educate you on the science of systems. The science of systems, you will get a one-hour education. How much you have to pay me? Zero. But your children and bring your children, they will learn how to start thinking using systems thinking approaches, which should be taught at the kindergarten level. That's the third part, education, innovation. Our goal is to make sure our children are smart. You're smart. I give away and I teach you the seven secrets of innovation. And when you understand that, we can start creating a vibrant economy where you create new businesses, new ideas. We're not talking about creating a Facebook or Google. You can create much more modest things, but still have very powerful effect. That's our innovation program. Governance. Again, we'll do this three Thursdays from now six or whatever, nine Thursdays ago, something like that, or yeah, I taught people how to become a leader. I taught you the principles of leadership, gave you very practical ways on how you build teams. Again, you're not going to get this anywhere. You may want to pay $120,000, $300,000 to go to Harvard Business School, but you get that here for nothing. That is our governance program. Government ain't going to do anything. They're all corrupt. They have, they're all controlled by lobbyists. Don't wait for them. We will teach you how to do that here now. The economy, as I did, was it 
eight Thursdays ago, right? We taught people what is a profit and loss statement? What is a balance sheet? What is cash flow? 80, 90% of CEOs don't even know what they are. This is why you have the government printing money, but you will learn how to manage your wealth, how to create wealth and these things. That is our account economic program. So I hope everyone understands what we're doing here is giving you the tools. That is a unique presidential campaign. What other, all of these guys are coming top down. We want to empower you bottoms up. I hope you're understanding this is a foundational difference when you have one of you wanting to lead you. When you have one of them, they're going to say, vote for me, give me money. Why is anyone giving money to billionaires? Can you tell me that? When did we become so freaking stupid that we give them our money? These guys don't need your money. Tell them to go take money out of their own bank accounts and spend it if they so believe in their campaigns. Tell them to go do that. Why does Donald Trump need any more money? He made a half a billion dollars using my data for his, for election fraud and he didn't any, didn't do anything about it. Well, Jared Kushner got 2 billion dollars from the Saudis. Why is anyone listening to the boo hoo hoo of Trump? And giving him money. Why are you? Why is anyone giving the Kennedy fellow any money? The Kennedys get cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching of every scotch that comes still into this country. So we got to stop being stupid, okay? Sorry, that's the way we speak in New Jersey. All right. All right. So let's talk about this reality here. So when you look at this, this is our campaign. And today we're going to talk about eating locally. And let me just make it uh, very clear to you that this behind this curve here, it's not any one thing. People say, oh my God, it's a vaccine. No, it's not just a vaccine. Wake the hell up. It's a whole bunch of issues. It's GPOs and PBMs. It's a reductionist um, you know, corporate tax. It's the offshoring of tax havens. It's a covert imperialist wars. It's a big pharma academic collusion. It's a whole bunch of things. It's policies over the last 60, 70 years, starting with the Kennedy administration that has led to that. And it's a whole bunch of things. And let me just uh, go back to this. And um, those were those key slides I wanted to share. But today, we are going to talk about the environment. We're going to talk about how we actually solve it here and now and how you can take care of yourself now. And what I'm going to give practical advice on is how you as an individual in your local community need to support your local environment, make sure you're getting proper food into your mouth, because nutrition is the key to long life, nutrition. And where does nutrition come? Well, learning what to eat, getting nutritious foods, and supporting a local ecosystem so you can not have to rely on an avocado being $3 or an apple being picked halfway around the world and have to be transported here. And that comes through supporting local farmers, getting organic foods, and staying away from these genetically engineered foods. So what is genetically engineered foods? Last week, I didn't go into this. Each of our town halls, when I speak about one of these issues, will be more detailed. And we will be putting up all of these town halls on Shiva for President's site. So I want to now educate you a little bit on what are genetically um, modified foods, all right? What are they at a fundamental level? Um, so let's begin. I um, gave this presentation years ago, so but it's still very relevant today. Let me start. So. Um, back in 20, I think it was 2014, I was walking literally, I was teaching a class at MIT, and I was walking down the hall, the main infinite court of MIT, and I see this, I see this uh, newspaper, okay, that, actually, this is a magazine. By the way, if you don't know, the MIT Technology Review is the most respected technology magazine in the world. It's put out by the MIT uh, publishing office. Um, many, many years ago, uh, you know, I was on the front page of it for inventing Echo Mail, which was the AI company for automatically analyzing and routing email, right? So it's a big prestigious thing. But anyway, technology review on the front page, uh, when I was walking down in 2014, I see this big article. And it really caught me off. And it said, buy fresh, buy GMO. If you know, this is buy fresh, buy local. So these nerds at MIT were taking the buy fresh, buy local and twisting it. And they were saying, buy fresh, buy GMO, all right? And it really annoyed me and to figure out what's going on. And I hadn't really done a lot of research and really understanding what are genetically engineered foods, but, me, but, but it started me on this journey. And, it, and I ended up writing a number of papers on this, all right? So 
let me first of all explain to everyone what is genetically engineered foods. All right. So let me uh, uh, bring you a point here. So you, we put this in the political context because part of what I'm talking about is policy, how it affects your biology. Um, some of you may know this quote that Eisenhower gave. By the way, he was part of the not so obvious establishment. Ah, uh, you know, two days before he's retiring, then he gives this very, very nice speech, right? After he'd uh, been part of the entire military industrial complex, he said, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unward and influence, whether sought or unsought by the military industrial complex. This was his way of redeeming himself, but you gotta remember, he's also a scumbag. He does this after. He didn't put his butt on the line and everyone quotes him, oh my God, Eisenhower said this great stuff. Well, what did you do when you were there? Like you waited so you wouldn't get shot or you don't wanna really risk your life. So, you know, it's, it's not really anything noble. After he screwed at anyone, then he puts out this quote. Now, another guy called William Fulbright, by the way, they called it the military industrial complex, the, 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 the interaction between the military and industry. By the way, Eisenhower's original speech said military industrial academic complex, Jay Stratton, who was a science advisor, was the president of MIT at the time, took away the word academic, okay? They just wanted to be military industry. They didn't want academics to be exposed in this. Um, several years later, Fulbright, Senator Fulbright from Arkansas, wrote a book called The Pentagon Propaganda Machine, and he gave a talk, and he was the first one to use the term military industrial academic complex. And the reason I bring up this picture is, um, even though I went to school at MIT, when I exposed the fact that I invented email before MIT, that I was spit out of this military industrial academic complex because only white people, it seems like, according to Walter Isaacson's book, can be part of the military industrial complex, surely not a dark skinned 14 year old darky like me who grew up in Newark, okay, that doesn't fit. But the point is a military industrial complex likes to take claim for all great innovations, it's not true. So when I saw the saying, here was a military industrial complex at MIT trying to give you advice on what you should eat. They're saying eat GMOs and that, and if you read the subtitle, it goes population growth and climate change. By the way, this is a fear stuff they always do, will make it harder to feed the world. We need to overcome our fears of genetically modified food. Doesn't this sound very familiar? We need to overcome our fears of vaccination. Mm -hmm. So they always make it about climate change and population. And therefore you should you know, do whatever the hell we say because we're smarter, okay? The reality is that they have a financial motive. All right. One of the biggest financial motive companies is a company called Monsanto. Monsanto, which is now merged with Bayer, at that time they weren't, Monsanto, uh, is backed. Uh, it's basically one of the goals of Monsanto is to really um, monopolize seeds. Okay, that's really their goal. They merged with Bayer recently. Now they control 67% of the seeds in the world. It's really about monopolizing seeds because they own the seeds and you have to pay for their seeds and you have to pay an annual license fee to use their seeds. It's like software. Anyway, at that time, Monsanto um, uh, was heavily involved in genetically engineered foods. By the way, when we say genetically engineered and genetically modified, they're actually the same, okay? So genetically engineered foods means GMOs. Um, now, one of the important things to recognize about uh, Monsanto is that Hillary Clinton's campaign manager um, was one of the senior executives at Monsanto in 2016. Robert Booby F. N. Kennedy, guy, I think we should put five mouths on this guy. This guy speaks from five different ways, okay? Um, he endorsed Hillary Clinton not once in 20, 2008, not twice in 2012, but in 2016 when she was running against Trump. Here's a woman who was pro-Monsanto, rapidly pro-Monsanto, rapidly pro-vaccine uh, mandates, and Booby F. and Kennedy, one day he says he's pro-vax, another day he's for medical freedom, one day he's uh, uh, he supports a Ukraine war for all the right reasons, another day he attacks Biden. You can't trust this guy. He's a fucking Kennedy, okay? They say anything, they murder people, they spit on cops, they get away with it because they're Kennedys. No more, we can't support these people. Anyway, Booby F. and Kennedy, you have to remember, he endorsed Hillary Clinton, Miss Monsanto Queen, Miss Vaccine Queen. Please write that down and share it with your friends. All right, so at that time in 2014, you have now academia colluding with Monsanto, trying to tell all these scientists doofuses, oh, uh, genetically engineered foods are great, they're just the same as, uh, so a genetically engineered um, uh, tomatoes are great, is the same as a non-genetically engineered. So that was a motive. 
So where did this stuff come from? Well, we have to recognize there is a very, very, um, yeah, what does Hillary eat? Yeah, Hillary and Bobby Kennedy live in Malibu or they New York and they eat organic foods, guys. They eat biodynamic organic foods, all right? But they want you to eat genetically engineered foods. One rule for me, another rule for thee, okay? So let's talk about uh, where this whole notion of genetically engineered foods comes up. And one of the things you have to recognize is Joe fucking Rogan, another bastard, when I started doing this research, he was heavily promoting genetically engineered foods. And when you walk through this history, I had just written these amazing six papers exposing them. Many people wrote to Rogan and they said, you got to put Dr. Shiva on. You know who Rogan put on then? He put on the Monsanto shill scientist out of uh, Cornell on, okay? And that's who he was promoting. And he could have easily put me on the MIT PhD, but he wouldn't. He acted dumb. Now he says, oh, I didn't know. Now he's like, oh yeah, maybe vaccines are bad. Well, it's three years too late, Joe, because now you need to get viewers. So again, give you the context. This was very new for a scientist at my level of stature out of MIT exposing this. I put a lot on the line to do this. No other scientist like myself did this. So Monsanto as a company originally started creating pesticides with companies like Syngenta. These are called the agrobiotech bigwigs. So farmers, let's say in the Midwest would grow soy or they grow corn and you have these weeds coming up. Okay, big, massive farms. We're not talking about local farms, massive farms. And so Monsanto went to these farmers and they said, you know what? We got this great product called glyphosate and you pour it on your farm and it'll kill those weeds. You're gonna have a better yield. So the farmers um, getting suckered into this because remember farms were getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The government was paying some farmers not to farm and all these small farms, if you go look at the 70s, were getting devastated. So the farms were getting merged in. So the whole was industrial farming. And it's not about small farms. It's about big farms, big yields, et cetera. So Monsanto convinces tons of these farmers to pour glyphosate. Typically, you have an airplane and you pour all this uh, glyphosate on your farm. Okay. So what happens? Well, Glyphosate, sometimes called Roundup, right? That's the name you can go at Home Depot called Roundup. So they pour glyphosate, it kills the weeds, and um, the farmers say, oh, we're getting better yields. All right. So now they essentially have pretty much every major farmer and all the big farming conglomerates using glyphosate. They're making billions off of this. All right. So that's point T equals zero. Everyone's using glyphosate. Then what the farmers start noticing is the glyphosate is actually killing some of the corn. Got it? The glyphosate is not only kill the weeds, but it's also killing the corn. So they go, oh, okay, what do we do now? So they did an unnatural thing. They didn't figure out how to use natural pesticides, you know, like people have been doing for thousands of years, all right, without starving. They wanted to control people not figuring out how to do biodynamic farming, not figuring out how to support the soil, you know, just like your gut, the soil bacteria are key. But, you know, military solution, drop the same stuff that they dropped, you know, not that far different in Vietnam, right? Blow away everything. So that was the solution. So now you have corn actually dying from the glyphosate. So you had yield go up, now yield's going down. So the scumbag scientists, the nerds who, uh, many of them are unhealthy as a hell. Uh, they say, okay, why don't we do this? Why don't we uh, create a new type of corn or a new type of soybean, Roundup Ready Soy or BT corn? And what we will do is we will genetically engineer a corn or soy, let's take soy, Roundup Ready Soy. And what we will do is we will insert a gene into this soy plant that will be resistant <laughs> to the glyphosate, okay? So they genetically engineer a new soy plant. They genetically change it. So the corn, remember before this, farmers are plant planting their own corn. They get weeds and they buy the Roundup. Then the Roundup is also killing their corn. 
So they, they go to the farmers and they say, look, we have a new corn seed for you. And when you plant the seed, the corn that comes up will be resistant to our pesticide. So now you have, you, you, they already got everyone buying this pesticide. They go, okay, we'll also buy your corn or your soy. So when we plant the soy, um, when the soy plant grows, it's gonna be resistant to the, to the Roundup. Everyone clear? So now they got two products that they're selling farmers. They're selling them the pesticides and they're licensing them, get this, they license the soy seed. Remember in the old days, you grow your soy or your corn and the, the soy plant or the corn gives um, seeds and you save some of it for the next year. Uh-uh, no more. You can't do that with Monsanto. You have to buy their seeds the next year and the next year, next year. If you store their seeds, you're violating their licensing agreement. No way. Yes, way. <laughs> okay, Ken's saying no way. And let's say I have a couple of people here. So let's say Ken over here has his farm and he's all gung-ho Monsanto and he's growing a thousand acres, 10,000 acres of Roundup Ready Soy. And Jason over here wants to be organic. And one day, one of these soy seeds drops in Jason's plant, uh, farm. Guess what? Monsanto will send the police and, uh, and themselves and they will shut down Jason's farm, literally. This is no kidding. And Jason, they'll say, we're gonna put you out of business. You, you're, you have our uh, seeds over there. You're pirating our seeds. You must pay us a license fee. All right, this is what's actually going on. And why hasn't this been talked about in the press? Why isn't any other presidential candidate talking about it? You know why? Because they're all part of this. Booby F and Kennedy supported Hillary Clinton. They're gonna be shut. He'll talk, ah, I'm about, full of shit. Now, I've been talking about this for nearly over 10 years now, okay? So that's the game. So now Monsanto has, they're selling glyphosate. They got pesticide cornered and they're selling the seeds. And in fact, they're not selling, it's a license model. So now you got a beautiful recurring revenue stream, right? It's like a magazine subscription model. All right, how did they get this through the FDA? How did all this happen? So let's go to that so you understand this because this will go back to why we must buy local. So again, getting back to this, I see this. And at that time in 2014, go look at the press, you'll see pro-GMO debate. Yes, we're pro-GMO and you'll see the non-GMO debate, just like pro-vax, anti-vax. And I said, there's gotta be, what's the real truth here? Because all the non-GMO people are saying crazy shit, like the, the, the non-vaxxers, oh my God, there's reptiles controlling them. Yeah, the same stuff. Because you gotta remember all of these movements get infiltrated. People on the non-GMO side weren't even making scientific arguments when there were sub substantial amounts. They would say crazy stuff. And I believe they did the crazy stuff so the pro-GMO people could easily attack them. Just like we saw in the pro-election integrity, no election integrity. The CIA and the intelligence agencies are very quick to jump into these movements and say wackadoodle shit so the real stuff gets hidden. And we saw that with the election integrity movement. We saw that with the vaccine, uh, with the medical freedom movement, and we saw that with the non-GMO movement. So as a veteran of a fighter, I can tell you that they always like to make it a division, divide and rule, pro-GMO, anti-GMO. And I wanted to get to the heart of this. Now, in fact, there were articles like this, right? Running on Bloomberg, you know, people <laughs> dancing around GMO corn here, all right? And the Atlantic, the very real, uh, and then some people were talking about the very real danger of genetically modified foods. Some people were talking about the Monsanto menace, but they weren't addressing this fundamental issue. They were still being pro or anti-GMO. So you had articles like this and articles like this, okay? So I wanted to get to the heart of this. Now, so you had non-GMO on one side and GMO, and people were saying, oh, uh, David Bannon and the Hulk were the same, right? It doesn't matter, they're the same. No different by saying, What's the difference between a genetically modified tomato and a non-genetically modified tomato? So this is a fundamental issue. What is the difference? How do you, so th those in power basically are saying, don't worry, Bob, the genetically engineered tomato is exactly the same as a non-genetically engineered. See, it's red, it's red, it's juicy, it's juicy. They're all the same, eat it. All these people are just scaring you. It's the exact same. It's called equivalence. And this is a very, very fundamental question 
that very few people understand. And so basically the scientists were saying, oh, see, they're exactly the same. See, they got green, they got green, they got a smiley face, smiley face. They're, they're uh, red, red, it's the same. Looks, look, they're exactly the same. And how did they decide that they were exactly the same? Now you gotta go study history. In 1976, uh, Gerald Ford signed into law a bill um, called substantial equivalence, okay? And substantial equivalence came into being, and here's a program, it's called the 510K program, evaluating substantial equivalence in pre-market notifications, guidance for industry and food and drug administration. This became the guidance document. And why did this come into being? Why did this come? You see, at that time in the 1970s, let's say I'm a medical manufacturer, by the way, which is under the FDA, and let's say I produce a stethoscope. And it took me seven, 10 years to make the stethoscope, which is a medical device. And I have to get it approved by the FDA before I can sell it. So it took me seven years, let's say, to get it through the FDA. So the government was saying, wow, um, it takes a lot of time for innovation. You know, some people are making good products. It takes a long time to get it out to market. And let's say after I created the stethoscope, and let's say the color of that stethoscope was white, and I made one little modification. I made it a black stethoscope, okay? It would, again, take me seven more years to get it through. So rightfully, some uh, the entrepreneurs are saying, hey, this sucks, right? This is slowing down innovation. So what they did was substantial equivalence was, oh, okay, you got a white stethoscope and you got a black stethoscope. If you can prove they're still the same, we don't have to go through the seven-year process. You could fast track it within a year. But you have to prove as a manufacturer, per this guidance, per this law, that they're substantially equivalent. It was called the manufacturer should clearly identify the technological characteristics of each device individually, okay? So what they said was you as a manufacturer, if you, you basically say, hey, look, I'm coming up with the characteristics of the stethoscope. It's this long, length was an issue, maybe the color, maybe uh, the weight, right? So you said, I have three characteristics. See, they're the same. The only thing is a black color. And if you could, so you as a manufacturer get to choose the criteria, and you have to compare it with the old one and the new one, if they're substantially equivalent, the FDA will fast track it, all right? So that was done for medical devices, medical devices, all right? So when, um, and by the way, the equivalence depends on what characteristics or criteria is selected. So when genetically engineered soybean comes into the market, um, people, the numb nuts in Congress, and these people are very, very dumb. They don't study. They all just pay off people. And this is why we need a systems overhaul. This is why you need someone like me as president. Um, is that the Congress people, they went to Congress and they said, oh, now we have genetically engineered soy. How do we get this approved through the FDA? And these guys say, oh, let's use that substantial equivalence document that was used for medical devices. Now, remember, a medical device only has like five or 10 parts, 20, maybe 100. <laughs> How many parts does soybeans have? They have hundreds of thousands of parts. The parts are all those molecular pathways. Now, remember, you have people who don't study, who sat in the back of the room, whose mama and papa, um, you know, let them go to school for free. They paid off uh, they, uh, the someone to write their essays. These people get it all hand fed to them. They never have to work. So they said, oh, soybean, it looks like that. So, yeah, yeah, let's use substantial equivalence. So the FDA, based on the lobbyists and based on Congress, allowed substantial equivalence to be used as the basis for getting a GMO soy substantially equivalent to a non-GMO soy. And who got to decide that? Were Monsanto. Monsanto said, okay, we're gonna decide according to, the oh, it's, it's round. I don't know, I'm making this up right here, the characteristics. Oh, if it's round, if it's white, it weighs this much. They said, okay, this soy is round, it weighs this much, it's got this much water content. And our non-GMO has that much. Great, it's equal. Let's get it through. Okay? So they define the characteristics of equivalence. So when I got into this, I said, wait a minute. How did they define the characteristics of equivalence? There has to, you have to go to the fundamental issues to understand how this is different. So, and again, no one had done this at the time. No, most people didn't, even, even the people in the non-GMO movement didn't even know what substantial equivalence was. They were just out there, oh yeah, we're against GMOs, we're against GMOs, because, why, uh, because, uh, why, because, uh, because Monsanto is evil. Okay, so 
many of you know, I developed a very powerful technology called Cytosol. And using Cytosol, which came out of PhD work where we could model very complex systems, I said, what is the difference? And what I did was I started looking at all the literature written on, for example, so I mined which Cytosol of all of these literature. No, by the way, no one paid us for this research. No one funded us. Didn't get one penny while I'm running my company. I did this as a noble service. Why? Because I, my grandparents were farmers. I never saw genetically engineered foods. I care about my health and I care about your health. And I could see there was something seriously wrong. We didn't start a nonprofit and beg people for money. I just went and did it. Okay. No one funded us. Not one penny. All right. So the first paper I wrote was I looked at all this and I went through 184 scientific journals. I'm sorry, that spanned 600, 837 experiments in 23 countries. And I built the first systems architecture of C1 metabolism. I wanted to find out how plants function. You see, every plant in the universe sequesters carbon, right? Because carbon is what you need to make, uh, and it uses carbon as a machinery to do this very interesting metabolic pathway. Methionine is synthesized, which goes through a methylation cycle. And by the way, this generates formaldehyde, which is toxic. It's a waste product. And every plant is doing this sort of engine. And then the formaldehyde in a normal plant is detoxified, okay? There's something in there called glutathione. But if you, every plant in the world uses a C1 meta meta uh, metabolism pathway. So I discovered this engine by going through all of this and I discovered the me molecular pathways of, sorry, methionine biosynthesis, documented that, discovered the methylation cycle, which is this red here, discovered the formaldehyde detoxification pathways, and I published a paper on that very quietly in the Journal of Agricultural Sciences. So the first paper I did, we didn't get funded. I did this because I wanted to do the fundamental research. We analyzed all these papers and we built the first um, systems architecture and I publish this in a journal, a peer reviewed journal. By the way, Monsanto was published in this journal. And after I published, some fool said, oh, this journal is not a good journal. Uh, well, Monsanto was published in there too, okay? So we published this paper, no one said anything. This journal basically said, hey, these are the molecular pathways of plants, okay? Done. The next thing I did was using Cytosol, I took all of these molecular pathways and I mathematically modeled it. I wanted to find out what happens when C1 metabolism happens in plants? What are the fundamental variables, okay, that really distinguish plant metabolism? So when I ran this through, I found out something interesting. There's a very important nutrient. In fact, you have it in your body. It's called glutathione. It's the most powerful antioxidant. And in a normal plant, the, the glutathione levels are maintained at a, at a beautiful steady state level, okay? And formaldehyde is created, but then it gets consumed, right? So the bottom line is your plants do create formaldehyde, but they consume it. Because glutathione levels are made, that's the antioxidant. Your body, for example, makes uh, toxifying things and your body cleans it up, but you need glutathione. So this was a normal case. No one had any problem with this. I did sensitivity analysis and we published that in another journal called the American Journal of Plant Sciences in silico modeling of those pathways. No one said anything, everyone was fine. Then again, did it on my own while running other companies, while being an activist. Again, this was done on my off time, staying awake until two, three in the morning, doing this with our science team. Next, what I did was I said, okay, what happens when plants undergo stress? Just like you undergo stress, plants also can undergo stress. What is stress? They get drought, right? Uh, maybe they get hit with pesticides, right? Maybe they don't get proper food. So that's when a, when a plant undergoes oxidative stress. It typically happens when drought occurs, right? Plants don't get enough um, uh, water or something happens in the environment. That is called a stressful condition. They're under oxidative stress. So I looked at those pathways. So here you have the methionine synthesis pathways. And I looked at the oxidative stress pathways and identified three of those subsystems where reactive oxygen species get created. You have lipid peroxidation and you have ascorbate glutathione pathways. And I connected them together. This is a systems approach. So we had done this in the two papers on the right. And this was my new understanding. And what I noticed is when I put all of this together with Cytosol, which is by the way, technology that I created for humankind out of my PhD work, 
and we did, gave it away for free here, we noticed that in the normal case, glutathione levels are the green line, but when plants undergo stress, guess what happens? Their glutathione levels get depleted. Everyone see that? They go boom down, that's the red line. Normal case, so when a plant's undergoing stress, just like when you're under stress, your body depletes its glutathione. That's why it's very important to, if you're under stressful conditions, eat you know, N-acetylcysteine, make sure you're supporting your glutathione levels, okay? And guess what happens? Because your glutathione levels drop, the plant, or not you, the plant doesn't have enough glutathione to detoxify itself and formaldehyde levels will go up, okay? And, and, and I did sensitivity analysis and same here. So and under all different conditions, glutathione level goes up. So let me repeat, when a plant is under stress, glutathione levels will drop, formaldehyde will go up, right? Because glutathione is needed to detoxify. Everyone following? All right, so we published that third paper, published, boom, no one said anything. People thought it was a great paper. Again, we published this in the American Journal of Plant Science, a peer reviewed journal. Okay. Now, having done this, um, I was curious. Okay, so I published my first, I understand the me metabolic pathways. I've shown what happens under the normal condition, I've shown what happens with oxidative stress. What happens when a plant gets genetically modified? What happens when Monsanto went in and inserted that gene to create, let's say, Roundup Ready soy? What did it do at this molecular level? Again, no one had done this research. Should probably get the Nobel Prize for this, but we won't get it because we're not because because Nobel Prize Committee loves Monsanto. Okay. So what I noticed was when you do genetic modification, I found independent research saying that four enzymes are upregulated during genetic modification: catalase superoxide dismutase, glutathione reductase, ascorbate peroxidase, and one oxygen, um, reactive oxygen species. So these four chemicals are increased during genetic modification. When I plug those things in to our oxidative stress model, connected to our C1 metabolism model, put it all together, voila, look what we see here. We see that in the non-GMO condition, plants produce, uh, 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 formaldehyde, and guess what? It gets depleted, right? This is a normal case. But guess, look what happens in the GMO case. Formaldehyde increases. Why? Because of plants in the non-GMO case, which had glutathione are being depleted. So what I had shown here was when genetic engineering takes place, the plant is literally as though it's being under drought. It's in an oxidative, it's, it's freaking out. And so the glutathione levels drop to a lower level. And this is why it's my view that whenever they create genetically engineered seeds, they have to coat them with neonicotinoids because if they were to plant the normal seeds, they get eaten up by the uh, soil organism. This is no different than a bodybuilder getting injected with soy. He looks big, but he's actually weak. His nuts have shrunk, okay? In this case, the seeds are weak. So then guess, so not only do they have to do Roundup Ready soy? Then they have to do genetic modification. Then they coat the seeds. And by the way, the neonics get into the plant and they kill the bees. That's a whole nother story. But you can see the level of idiocracy that's going on here. But anyway, this was then published. Now, when this got published, this is when the bomb went off because I was showing that genetic engineering lowers glutathione levels, increases formaldehyde levels. And when this came out, boom, I start getting attacked. No one attacked the first three papers. When I showed this, you have the people at Cornell, you have the people in the European Union, everyone started attacking, oh, this research is just modeling. It is, it's, it's not true. It's just, it's all bullshit. It's just modeling, it's modeling. Well, um, what I then did was I said, okay, I'm going to compare our results with if I could find greenhouse results. And I was very lucky. A group in England had literally grown Roundup Ready soy plant in a greenhouse, which means the plant, which was a modified genetically engineered soy plant and the organic soy. We had used our models and we found out that you will have 230% less glutathione in our mathematical models predicted that you would have 230% less glutathione in the Roundup Ready soy. And, low, and when we published that, people said, oh, this is bullshit. Well, guess what? We were very fortunate. I, we found this paper that showed, so this is what these guys are, uh, by the way, this came out in, in another paper called Plant Physiology. 
by the American Society of Plant Physiologists, where these people in um, Leeds had found that when they grew the soy plant in vivo, which means in the soil, that the organic soy plant had 9.9 .9 levels of glutathione and the transgenic Roundup Ready plant had 3.7. You see, it's 230% less. And look what we found, same thing. And voila, our results concurred with their results. Now this, when this came out, you saw absolute silence in the industry. And no one has popularized this because we showed, and this was done over a series of five to six papers. So you guys, you understand, you're looking at someone who's an activist and who can get his hands dirty, do the research. And then we did major demonstrations. So from the activism to the research, to getting on the ground, that is a real human being. And that's what you deserve. So what I'm, when I say, that these big factory farms are now hooked onto Monsanto and they need to license their seeds, they're basically slaves. The small farms aren't there yet. And this is why if you, if you look at that chart, if you want your children to die younger, please, please, please keep going voting for these politicians, all of them. None of them are gonna talk about this. They're killing your children. Your children are going to die younger than you. Let me repeat that again. Your children are going to die younger than you. The foods that they're getting don't have enough antioxidants in them. This is one example. They have pesticides in them. They don't give a damn about you. Booby fucking Kennedy is eating organic food. Him and his plastic job wife are eating organic foods. The Clintons are eating organic foods. Donald Trump, bullshitter, he's not eating. Go, go look at what they serve at Mar-a-Lago. It's pasture-raised beef. Oh yeah, I eat McDonald's. Yeah, right, Donald. Go to John George's restaurant in Trump Towers. It's all organic foods. But they get the American work. Oh, look at Trump, he's one of us. He's not one of you. He's not one of you. Wake the fuck up, please. So now you understand, which you won't get this education anywhere at the fundamental level, and by the way, Monsanto, after all the research, I'd, after all the activism, in order to change their brand, they got merged under Bayer, under Children's Aspirin brand, okay? That's what they do. But Bayer and Monsanto now control 67% of the seeds. It's about seed licensing. So you understand how the policies passed by Democrats and Republicans, by the way, uh, Trump supports GMOs, the Republicans support GMOs, Democrats support GMOs, all of them do. And genetically engineered foods are weaker. They're not substantially equivalent. And that's what I exposed in Bear View. Neil Young, the, the uh, what is it, the uh, rock guy, he called me up and in Vermont, when they were stopping them, he had me come and I gave the science talk. And you know, Neil Young is an opportunist. He was putting out a, an album on Monsanto, so he, so he was getting in the hype, but then he became a pro-vaxxer, okay? Joe Rogan, who was pro-GMO, now is an quote-unquote anti-vaxxer, but he really wasn't. You see, you can't trust these guys. They speak from five sides of their mouth based on which way they need to get their views. I was the one who did this when it was unpopular to do it. You deserve somebody who will protect you and fight for you. Now, you understand why we need locally grown foods. The big factory farms are interconnected with government. They're interconnected with the big Monsanto, Bayer, and all the seed companies. The last hope for your children is to eat locally grown organic foods. And by the way, you got to do it on a budget. You go try to go to Whole Foods and try to get an avocado. It's $3. I mean, I can't believe there isn't a revolution yet. I can't believe the people at Whole, the people working at Whole Foods are sitting there selling $3 avocados to these bougie people and there isn't a revolution. I really can't believe this, okay? I really don't understand it, okay? And the reason is because these foods are shrinking people's testicles and making men women and women men, right? So people are all confused. That's not seriously what's going on. Where are the men who would fight and be warriors? Well, their nuts are shrinking, literally. Testosterone levels are dropping. Sometimes I feel like I'm the last of the Mohicans, okay? But that's what's going on, guys. So now let's talk about what you can do. We're never going to pass a bill to solve this. They're all bought and paid. So we got to figure out what to do right now. So let me talk to you about the solution. Remember, today's town hall is about the environment. 
Today's town hall is about the environment. Our environmental policy is that when I become president, I'm going to, uh, you know, pass a bill which will force Monsanto. Bullshit. You're not going to do jack shit. What you're going to do is get me to vote for you. And, and when you get it, you're just going to strike some deal. We're on the back end. They still get to do the same things. It's not going to happen, guys. So what do we do? Well, this is what we're going to do. And this is the only thing to do. You have to start taking control of your life, okay? You have to start supporting your local farmers. You have to start learning maybe even how to have a garden. You have to start understanding what is food. You have to first of all understand food is medicine. And if you're eating shitty food and you're not even conscious of food, well, it starts with you. If you're watch, if you think Donald Trump is eating McDonald's all day, you're pretty, you're pretty brainwashed. All right. So let's start with basics. Food is medicine. All right. And all of us from the day that we're born in this society, you have deficiencies in your body. When you're a child, some of those deficiencies you can get away with. But as you get older, if you don't address those deficiencies, your body will start aging and your immune system will get destroyed. So you have to get the proper nutrients. The body lives in its vessel and it interacts with nature. And all the things you need still today are in nature. And you have to support the body with the right nutrients. Nearly every disease, all disease in ancient systems of medicine has the same cause. It is nutrition and it's a deficiency in nutrition. And you have to understand your body. You have to become conscious. There's no formula. Stop following a diet. You have to get conscious. And it's like riding a wave. You have to watch what you eat. You have to be aware. And you have to figure out what's right for you. But there are some fundamentals. One of the fundamentals are the reason you want to eat locally grown foods is because you can see where the food comes from. You're supporting a local economy. You can have effect locally. You're not going to have effect at some you know, grand level in DC, they're all bought and paid for. So number one, I've just shared with you GMO research. The key is, if you're gonna buy local foods, it can't be a bougie thing. Right now it's a bougie, bougie thing, right? But what I'm gonna show you today, how do you do it locally, okay? Well, first of all, we wanna help you buy uh, local foods on a budget, but, and you wanna be able to support your local economy. Now, why do we want to do this? Well, first of all, there's some very important health, health benefits. When you buy foods from people who actually care, right, they're going to actually make sure the food does not have pesticides. They're going to want to make, make sure you're their neighbor. Oh, you know which guy killed you if you ate this food. You know, we know where he lives, okay? So they want to know there's, you want to know where the food's coming from. You want to see it. You want to smell it. Uh, and by the way, have you noticed most of the food doesn't smell? The apples don't smell, the oranges, none of, none of the food smells. I mean, in a good way, there's no fragrance left in foods because they're not real food anymore. They've been depleted from their soil. All right, so number one is the health benefits are you can actually see the food. You're buying from people who care. So you're gonna get a higher quality of food by and large, you're increasing the probability. And the food is gonna be more fresher. Remember, most of the food that you get, go look at those avocados. They're freaking hard by the time they come, right? They pick green bananas that travel a thousand miles. You don't know how, what real food is because by the time it's picked and put in, it's going through a very different chemical process of ripening. It's not natural. But when you get locally grown foods, you're getting foods that are harvested within hours, particularly if you go to these farmer's markets. And what that means is they're riper, they're more mature. And unlike the traditional centralized produce, you know, that can be picked green, like I mentioned, up to two weeks before it lands in the supermarket shelves. So that's a very different chemical process. I would argue that isn't even a normal food. So the other thing is you're supporting someone who's smaller. And when they're smaller, they're using a much different farming system. It's more diverse. Uh, they're not just monocropping. Monocropping is if you go to these large farms, huge 10,000 farms are all they're growing is soy. Soy, 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 they deplete the soil. In a small farm, they're rotating the soil. The soil bacteria are healthier. So you get diverse farming. It's a very important aspect here. Um, now, the other thing to understand is many of the local food systems are in fact organic. 
the interesting thing to note is many of those local farmers are completely organic, but and they can't get the organic certification because of the expense, and they don't want to be do the organic certification because they're going to have to crank up their price. So, but by and large, you can talk to these farmers, you can understand how their farming is typically organic, and um, it's typically much cheaper to produce uh, than the organic quote unquote stuff that's coming from thousand miles away, and much of that food that they produce has lower pesticide residues and it's it, the soil health is much better. So those are the health reasons. Now, what are the community benefits? First of all, you're getting away from the big food chains. Okay. It's very important to support these local farmers because once you start supporting them, more local farmers will come up and you're essentially creating a more resilient system versus supporting one whole foods and then, oops, we didn't get supply today. There's no food here today. So, right. Oh, we don't have lettuce. So now you've concentrated in a centralized system and that's not a resilient system from a system science perspective. And I encourage all of you very quickly to let you know that everything I'm speaking about is a system thinking approach. And please go to truthfreedomhealth.com and become a warrior scholar. It's one way you can support us. The other way, quick sort of advertising break, you know I'm running for president. You know, I encourage you to donate and volunteer cheaper for president.com. And donation means when you give any money, five, 10, whatever dollars you wanna give, I actually give you books. I give you access to many, many courses. I cannot take money from you without giving you something back. And we've always done that. But go to shivaforpresident.com, donate or volunteer, or just go to truthfreedomhealth.com and become a warrior scholar and get all this knowledge. All right, end of uh, commercial break, all right? So what I wanna let you know is that when you um, go um, to your local uh, food areas, you're supporting your local farmers. You're creating a much more resilient system. It's not coming from 1,500 miles away through some quote unquote supply chain. And finally, when you support these local farmers, you get to keep those dollars in the community. And those farmers can then use that to keep growing more delicious food. They can sustain their families. And you're essentially creating a resilient food system because you're also supporting other farmers to come up. They say, wow, farming is a good business. You know, there's more demand here for locally farmed foods. What are the cost benefits? Look, sometimes right now it can be a little more expensive if you are in a place where there's not enough local farmers, right? But the reality is um, um, it, it, many of, some people have created these, uh, some people have critiqued, hey, locally grown foods are expensive. It's an elitist market. It's true, you may spend a little bit more money at a farmer's bar market, but I'm, I'm here to give you some ways that you can buy and get be better bang for the buck. So let, let, me, let me give you some um, important things. First of all, much of the farmer's market produce is organic. And the reality is, even though they don't have the organic label, you may th it's, it's actually 40% cheaper than the organic food uh, sold in grocery stores. So keep that in mind. It may seem more expensive, but when you compare it to the organic food with the organic label, it's actually 40% cheaper. That's the first thing. So remember that. Now the local farmers don't have to, you know, there's no shipping. So one of the strategies here is to buy the seasonal foods. Because if you buy the seasonal foods, there's lots of it and you'll get higher supply, lower price, okay? So look for the seasonal foods when you do this. And um, remember most produce can be bought year round at the traditional grocery stores but shopping at a farmer's market forces you to buy foods that are in season. And when you buy foods that are in season, it's being grown more frequently and in larger quantities, and that means it costs less to you. So that's one, two tips right there. You know, if you look at organic, it, it, they may not have the organic label, talk to them. It is typically organic, but you're getting 40% less. And then buy foods that are in season. Now, when you buy locally, you help reduce the amount of travel you're doing. Think about it, right? to buy groceries, because you just go to the local farmer's market and be right nearby. You're not driving back and forth and buying foods that may also, um, you know, I just bought some food It never even got ripe. It was some papaya, right? They're not even getting ripe anymore, okay? So you're just wasting your money. And typically you can also just walk to your farmer's market, right? They're nearby. You get to meet friends. You may make contacts. You may meet neighbors. You may meet the local plumber. You may meet some people that's gonna benefit you in other ways, okay? And if you walk, you might have to start um, shopping more frequently because you can only buy what you can carry. And this is also important because when you're local and you know it's locally, people typically buy all this food, 
they fill up their refrigerator and 50% of it they never use, right? It goes rotten, et cetera. So another one of the things when you start buying locally, your mindset changes, you look, you say, oops, that, I just bought this food. Let me only buy what I need because now you're more in connection. You're saying, oh, that food can go um, you know, bad. So I'm only gonna buy what I need. So you get a little more prudent about what you're buying. And this helps you avoid spending money, all right? And it's also another tip is buy in cash. If you take cash, credit card, it's sort of ethereal. But if you have X amount of cash, you know, take 20 or 40 bucks in cash, you're gonna be a little more frugal. If you take your credit card, and by the way, more and more of these stores don't want you to even pay in cash anymore, okay? The local farmers want cash for obvious reasons, okay? Now, here are some challenges, right? Um, sometimes finding farms is difficult. There are many good sites right now where you can find these farms, right? Um, buying local means, you know, you're not going to buy at Whole Foods, right? Buying local means you may not have the certified organic. Um, now, how to buy is look for locals, farmers, market. In fact, our movement, Truth, Freedom, and Health, I have a big parking lot here, and Jason's here. We're going to be starting our own farmers market. Those of you who get involved in the Truth, Freedom, and Health movement, we have created a program now how you can become part of the movement and we can teach you how to start your own local farmers markets, okay? That's something we're doing. You can go to lo local roadside stands. And by the way, one of the best days to shop is on Wednesdays in the middle. If you go to in the beginning of the week when they're first coming out, um, there's a lesser chance you're gonna get good deals. But if you go in the middle, they wanna sell. Now, the other thing is if you go to the farmers market, arrive early because they don't know how their sale is going to go, so they're going to try to get rid of it or arrive later. If you're in the middle, you typically don't get the best deal. So arrive really early or do it when they're going towards the end. And now also, as I mentioned, buy the fruits and veggies when, it's for, when, the, when they're peak in season, because that's when you're going to find some of the lowest prices that you'll see all year. And this goes for also the major commercial grocers. The other thing, as I mentioned, is pay with cash when you go to the farmer's market. One of the best money-saving tips is to carry cash. Now, while some of the vendors now allow you to pay with a card, um, most still prefer you pay with cash. And carrying cash also helps you make sure you only spend what you have um, and you buy frugally and buy what you need, as I mentioned. Don't buy just when you're hungry, okay? So this requires some planning ahead. Make a list. Look at what you have in your refrigerator. And it's very important to do cost-effective buying to, to, you know, um, if you can, you know, you'll, you'll also find out that some of the best cost-effective foods you may be able to grow on your own, tomatoes, cucumbers, herbs, uh, and more on your own. However, if you're like me and others, most of us should watch every, you know, penny saved is a penny earned. If you're on a budget, stick to just, a, you know, if you're going to do local planting, stick to planting a few plants. Don't try to do everything. It's too hard. You know, think about the major staples you want to plant and you can start to embrace eating locally without completely overdoing it. Okay. Now, if you can't make the farmer's markets, there's another trick I want to tell you. It's called community support agriculture, CSA programs. Many local farms are open and more accessible and they even have websites, but many are starting to offer CSA programs and CSAs are way of groups of people um, or sometimes just you, they go to a local farm and they pay a monthly fee, a flat monthly fee, 40 bucks a month. And every week you will get, you will get to go pick up a box of, and, and you won't know what you're getting. So it's a little bit of a surprise. Sometimes you'll get carrots, sometimes you get yams, sometimes you get broccoli and other times you get different things. And you can do this with meats also, but the farmers are happy because they know they're getting a monthly or a yearly fee. So now you're supporting them, right? And then they will make sure you're getting a box of diverse vegetables or a box of diverse meats. And now some farmers even offer to deliver these products to you at a reasonable cost. The other important thing I wanna end with is, if you know you're gonna buying a lot, you can get neighbors together. It's called group purchasing in a good way. And you can go to a farm and you can pool your assets and you can get a better deal. You basically become um, you're buying at wholesale in bulk. And if you do that, you can often often get 10 to 20% discounts or even higher if you, you know, buy the produce at bulk. 
but you have to be uh, you know, prepared to eat or freeze a lot of the produce you negotiate in that case. And it's best to try to go together with a few other families. So in closing, write this down, plan, make a list, go through the stuff that's getting old in your freezer. Don't buy stuff you don't need. Get frugal, get conscious, use cash, buy what's in season, buy what you need. And the other thing is go at the right time of the day so you get the best deals, either in the beginning or the end at the farmer's market. If and where possible, buy in bulk. And remember this, they may be organic, though they're not certified, all right? And make a budget. You can spend about 25 uh, bucks a week with the CSA, 100 bucks a month. And finally, grow your own. And remember, before I end this, Monsanto was bought to corner the seed market. And they do this with big factory farms. Remember, booby fucking Kennedy endorsed Hillary Clinton, not once, not twice, not three, three times. And she's Miss GMO. He eats organic food. Hillary Clinton eats organic food, but he endorsed Hillary Clinton. One of her biggest things was genetically engineered foods. So bottom line, what you've gotten today is very practical tools. You can review this video, what you can do to eat locally. But for God's sake, support your local small farmers. Learn how to get the right nutrition. Get frugal, get real with seeing the food that you're doing. But remember, the big factory farms, pesticides, genetically engineered foods, Hillary Clinton's, the Kennedys, they all backed all these people. All right, let's take some questions, John. Um, that took us, what? Is it 9.51 or 8.51? Wow. wow. All right, guys, you got a ton of, uh, no, let, let's do some interaction. Go ahead, John. Let's look at some questions from, from the chat. Okay. All right, so let's answer some questions on the chat. Ken, can you read the questions here on the chat right here? You see any questions here? All right, any questions? You can ask questions about the farm, GMOs, Monsanto, um, any of the people I've critiqued and exposed, anything you want. Would be great. Go ahead. Would be great if we had a contact to get cheap and free organic fruit, veggie seeds. Yes. So um, um, one of the things that's happening is that there are communities now preserving seeds and giving it away. So you may, uh, if you do some local checks on some of these local um, farming sites, do a little bit of Googling, you'll start finding communities. But it's a great question you're asking. One of the things we can do is we can all start you know, growing our own uh, products, but also preserving seeds locally. Next. The um, only one is talking about this regards to the generations. Uh, yep, I'm the only one, by the way, who's talking about this lifespan shrinking. And you know why the other guys don't wanna talk about it? Because it's gonna expose all of them because they're all been part of killing you. Remember, all of these people are bougie, man. They don't want you to live long. They'll live long. They get all the best foods, they get all the best vitamins, all the academics get the best healthcare. They do not want you to live long. I want you to live long because I'm one of you. They don't care about you. Next. Skylar is asking, um, sorry, uh, Sharon is asking, what about chemtrails junk landing on garden plants and dirt? Yeah, good question. You asked a great question. Look, this is why we need a political movement because no matter what you do, like there's a lot of these people saying, well, you know, I can't do anything. I'm going to go start my own local farm, right? Well, uh, you can start your own local farm. Great step. We support that. But you got shit falling in uh, from, the, from the skies. This is why we need a revolutionary movement. We need a, a bottoms up movement. Because even if you try to do your local farms, you still have to do, contend with the fact that we're part of a global economic system. And by the way, the movement for Truth, Freedom, Health we now have about a half a billion people know about our movement. We have close to half a million people gone through our programs in over a hundred countries. This is a global movement and it depends on you raising your consciousness. Great question. Yes, even doing your own little garden, it's a right step. You're taking control, but it doesn't solve the fundamental issues and we need an explosive movement to do that. Next. Uh, Hitty Bear on YouTube. Trump is what? Ad advisors. Yeah, so you have another unfortunate, naive person here. Ooh, Trump has bad advisors. Are you fucking serious? Please get your head out of your ass. This is like saying that Trump is all oh, poor Trump, poor Trump. 
man, the guy went bankrupt a bunch of times. He's got billions of dollars. Do you have a billion dollars? Do you have a golden plate of toilet seat? Do you get to bang women and then pay for whores and then pay for uh, and get rid of that? Like he does this. Do you understand? This is a conscious human being. Why the fuck are you so stupid to, I, I, I hate people excusing the bourgeois. How brainwashed are you? He chose his advisors. He brought Jared Kushner into the White House. He brought Ivanka Trump into the White House. Stop being dumb. What the fuck? I can't believe people are excusing people. They're fucking you and you're excusing them. What's your problem? Next. Uh, Titty Bear on YouTube is asking, uh, how will you get more exposure? Is it possible to get allowed to participate in the debates? Okay, another dumb question. Why don't you take this video and why don't you start exposing me? We're not waiting for them. Get on the ground. See, you're reliant. You're sucking the titty still. You're waiting for them to do something for us. You know what? By our own, by our own videos, we got out to about a half a billion people. How did we do it? We did it on our own. The future is offline. Please get disconnect and understand that all change occurs offline. So if you want to help this movement, please start asking the right questions and not for me, but for you, do it for your children. You can do more with one little flyer, which we put together. You can take a flyer, which is on our website and you can hand it out, but you got to start going local. Go to Truth, Freedom and Health, sign up and every Thursdays, we have an open house like we're going to do, we're, you know, but you have to start asking the right questions. We have a lot of people who are brainwashed, excusing these bastards, and that is what they are, and asking me, well, how, how are you going to get more exposure? I'm sorry, they are, do you understand they already know about us? That's why they're trying to make us invisible. We've already gotten tons of exposure. The issue is, what are you going to do? Are you going to take the videos I do? Are you going to distribute them? How clever are you going to be? It's up to you guys. I'm not going to do all the work. Come on. You do some work. Next. Uh, w Knight on YouTube is ask is uh, saying Trump was just indicted during the stream. Any comments? Who the fuck cares? Why do you care? The elites fight among each other. They devour each other. Let them devour each other. You should ask what the fuck did Trump do? when he was in office, he supported lockdowns. Why do you care for these people? They don't give a fuck about you. Get it through your head. Let them kill each other, let them annihilate each other, let them eat up, let them do whatever the hell they want. Are you gonna give him money? I hope you're not. Okay, he gets indicted. Okay, they shoot each other. Who cares? I don't care. As Malcolm X said, the chickens have come home to roost. Let's talk about us. Why do you care about the few who've been manipulating you? Did Trump care about you when he didn't fire Fauci? Did Trump care about you when he did Operation Warp Speed? Did Trump care about you when he took a million dollars from Pfizer? Did Trump care about you when Pfizer made $80 million? I mean, $80 billion? Did Trump care about you when his son-in-law got a $2 billion loan? Why the fuck do you care about these people? Start caring about yourself. Look what they've done. You, your children are going to die younger than you. Stop being brainwashed. That is what our movement is about. It's about you respecting yourself. Start asking the right questions. Stop being dumb. Next. John? Um. Another one from YouTube. How does the swarm expand its system to third world countries? Thanks. Okay, we talked about the swarm. What is the swarm? The swarm is a set of few people. That's what he's talking about, the elites, right, John? Yes. Okay. I did a video. Everyone should go study it. It's a beautiful diagram that goes into detail. It's a, it's a whiteboard diagram. In a little whiteboard, I show it with you how a few people control the many. And I call it the swarm. They're a swarm. It's a well-connected, multiracial, decentralized, well global group of people. Okay. I call it the swarm. It's when you see all those birds flying, you know, they look separate, but they're all together. They dance together. Well, the 
swarm in, involves the top 100 university leaders all over the world, from Oxford to IIT to MIT, et cetera. They're all, they all go to the same golf course. They all go to the same restaurants. Their children go to the same schools. That's one part of the swarm globally. So they're interconnected there. The NGOs, they, so the Clinton Global Initiative, the Gates Foundation, the WEF, they're also global, okay? And it's about 100 people who know each other. The top 2,000 CEOs of the global 2,000 companies, the top 100 Hollywood execs, you know, the top 10 social media influencers. And they have their political parties, their heads. You understand that all these people literally, I've seen them at the same restaurants together, guys. All of them go to the same restaurants. They play at the same gays. They go to the same parties. They bang the same people. They're one incestuous group. Get it clear how small of a tight-knit group they are. They're all chatting. They have their own social media groups. They all send each other birthday cards. So it's not like they're in any one place. They're a swarm globally organized, but well-knit. And they spend 24 seven using two wings of the obvious establishment and the not so obvious establishment. Kennedy, Trump, all these people party together. I mean, you see, I mean, they give you pictures of Clinton and Kennedy hanging out together. They're, they were all on Epstein's airplane. Come on, they're all one group. They tell it to your face they're together. And yet you ignore it. They're one. The establishment is one. And you're not part of it. Stop bowing down to them. Select one of your own as your leaders. Guys like me, guys like Malcolm X, and guys like you, women and men. And that's what our movement teaches. It teaches you the science of systems. It teaches you why we need to build a bottoms up movement. It is the most, it is the only force on the planet that will liberate the world because it's going into your mind. It's raising your consciousness. And I can see, and you, please, everyone, I, I'm, I'm, I'm attacking you, not to attack you personally, but to attack those neurons in your brains, which have been wired in some wackadoodle way. And hopefully my saying this makes you say, oh, what the fuck did I just ask? Yeah, what the fuck did you ask? Next. Um, Peter on YouTube is asking, how do you envision the new system once it's been disrupted? Great question, Peter. Great question. Now, let us talk about this. You're asking a very deep question. And if you read the book right there, System and Revolution is right over there, right there, okay? Um, one of the most fundamental things we need to understand is that systems are in different states of consciousness and different states of transition. A revolution is what's called a phase transition. So that's what a revolution is. I cannot answer that question in two minutes, but I'll try to give you the summary of it. Every system has a certain you know, wave pattern, okay, any system. And it transitions to different states. So if you look at the simple physical cases, you have ice. But we know exactly at around 32 degrees Fahrenheit, ice goes from the solid state to the liquid state, right? When it's 32 degrees, a little bit above, and then it becomes liquid. That's a different, that's a phase transition. And at the liquid stage, when it hits 212 degrees Fahrenheit, it goes from liquid to steam. So it goes through a phase transition. Now consider society like that. We have a current system right now, which is a few people and we're told, oh, this is just the way the world's got to be. You know, you all, you know, it's just the way the world is. Slavery is normal. Well, then we got to a different kind of slavery, but we've gone through these phase transitions. The most important thing right now, Peter, is there has never been an awakening where you have enough people understanding the concepts that I'm sharing with the concepts of system science, self-reflecting systems. And when you have enough people, and I believe it's about 10,000 leaders who get these, who go beyond left and right, who viciously expose the not so obvious establishment, the day change comes is when it's not like you say, oh, uh, yeah, McConnell is bad. The obvious devils are bad. But when you realize and you articulate with courage that Trump, the Kennedys, the Tucker Carlson's, the, the AOCs and the Bernie Sanders, the people who talk, 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 they're fighting for you. When you have the consciousness to realize that they are part of the establishment, that's when change is going to occur like that. So the issue is we have to achieve that level of consciousness. Now, it would be very wrong for me to say, oh, the utopia is going to be like this or like that. We're not even there. The issue is, can we get 
the temperature where it's 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And what occurs after that will be a phase transition that will be a self-organizing system. But to say it should be like this or that would be false because that would be a top-down approach. The issues to raise consciousness that occurred through different points in history. And what will emerge out of that will be something that will come from that raised consciousness. Thank you. Next. Um, on YouTube, someone's asking, uh, how many of the seeds have already been crossbred and genetically with genetically modified variants. Is there a reliable method to discern the authenticity of the original seeds? Yeah, that's a great question. Look, one of the things that's happened is many of these large companies have the originals, okay? Um, and these originals exist, but they have owned them. And this is something, and through policymakers in Congress, they have given these people the ability to own these things. And this is what needs to be busted up, but it's not gonna get busted up through legislation. It's gonna only get busted up through a bottoms up movement where we have a militant bottoms up movement. And when I mean militant, I'm not saying shooting guns. I'm saying where you have enough forces on the ground where people start boycotting, they start seizing um, you know, some of the means of production. Like imagine if the Whole Foods workers actually got their shit together and they realize that without the workers, there doesn't, there nothing happens. And imagine if the workers at Amazon truly organize a union and they shut down Amazon and they seize the means of production. That would be powerful. Now you have working people in control like that happened throughout history when real change happens. But to get to that, we need to build a bottoms up movement. So we need to unplug from the thing, oh, oh, Congress is gonna do something, these bills. No real change is gonna come that way, guys. Change has always come bottoms up when you put the fear of God into these people, not with the gun, not with some crazy violent action, but the fact, oh my God, uh, like the 95% are organized now, that's what they don't want. They want people to be divided, disorganized, disconnected. And that is why it's really important to raise our consciousness. That is what we're doing here. That's what the run for my president is. People should say, wow, there's this guy, Dr. Shiva. Oh my God, everything he says is incredible. Look at all the, these other idiots. Why am I even voting for these other idiots? What's wrong with me? Why am I saying, oh, an independent can't win? You know, we got to vote Republic. Like that whole thinking is what we got to overcome. Next. Um, Kanara is asking, what about broccoli? Isn't it created? How does it differ from GMO vegetables as it's still nutritious? What does she mean? Is it not created? I think it means like, would you find broccoli wild out in nature? Yeah. So let's talk about this. So there's been this very interesting um, conflation that many of the genetically engineered people have said, oh, they go, oh, all food in nature is genetically engineered. I don't know if you say, if you heard, they say, oh, GMOs is nothing big because throughout history, we've been genetically engineering food. One of the things we need to understand is there's a big difference between sexual hybridizing, you know, like the Incans would breed foods, okay? But it was through sexual reproductions. Very important to understand which is very different than when you, in a lab, do genetic engineering without any sexual interaction, which means you know plants pollinate. So in ancient times, people would learn how to pollinate different varieties, but that was still through sexual reproduction where you had full DNA transfer. That is very different than in a test tube, taking a point gene and doing that, okay? So Kinara, if you're saying, oh, broccoli is a hybridized vegetable, well, that's still through sexual reproduction. That is very different. And people have been doing that for ages, right? Because hu humans work with their foods. They, they do that with crops. They do that with animals. That is very different than doing a point genetic, uh, uh, you know, not a full sexual interaction between, uh, you know, the uh, entire, right, uh, DNA changing but if you're doing a point mutation in an in vitro lab, that is what is called genetic engineering. So don't conflate the two. One more question, John. Looking. Um, Adventurous Guide is asking, can we get an explanation on what is in some of the chemtrails and can it be washed off? Yeah, look, 
I I have I, I do so much stuff on so many different things. I haven't had a t chance to even look at what's going on with the chemtrail stuff. What's in it? What are the particulates? It's something I need to carve out some time to do. Um, but let me tell you one thing that is important to understand. Um, once you know what's going on, you can start taking some precautions, right? Uh, we do know if you're buying these pesticides, there are certain uh, uh, natural solvents you can use to wash them, right? Um, I don't know what's in this chemtrail stuff, whether it's whatever the hell it is, right? So I'd have to do a little bit of research before I speak to it, um, and I'll do some uh, work for you on that. But one of, one of the most important things you can do um, is to recognize that the body is resilient if you feed it proper nutrition, and particularly foods that support your immune system. So what I can tell everyone to do is start, on, go to the videos that we've done, start recognizing the power of the immune system. The immune system is critical to your protecting your whole body, the immune system. And there's many, many videos I've done on that. All right, John, in the interest of time, it's a little bit after 10. I want to, all the people in our town hall, please remain here because we're going to wrap up on Truth, Freedom, and Health. I do want John, while everyone's here, John, have we played the Truth, Freedom, and Health video? We did, right? Uh, yes. The we, Anthem video. John, can you play the features video? So everyone listening, I want John to play the features video because those of you who are new, those of you who are listening, one of the weapons that we have, and it took me nearly 40 years to put this together, we've put together an infrastructure that each one of you can understand system science, get the tools, and get become leaders in your own communities. And those of you who want to support our campaign, we must and we will get on the ballot. But with your help, we can get a ballot in every state. So go to shivaforpresident.com, sign up to be a volunteer or donate. And, but I want John to play the entire system of knowledge I've put together. And those of you who donate will also get access to this. Go ahead, John. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble queuing it up right now. Um, can you get it? I, I don't, maybe I... Um... All right, please find it, John. While John's doing that, let me let me essentially show you. Um, you had it, John. It's always there. Yeah, I don't know why it's not coming up right now. Okay, well, let me show you guys. I'll walk you through it manually. Um, if you guys go to truthfreedomhealth.com, you'll notice that we have a wonderful site, and this was built by volunteers, and we want to thank them all. And our slogan is get educated to be and save. And you notice Truth, Freedom, and Health itself is a system. And what is the problem we're fundamentally solving, okay? If you look at the world right now, we have access to tons of information, lots of information, yet billions of people, more and more people, nearly a billion people are getting more anxious and depressed. Half, half of the world's population is heading towards being obese. 52% of people are actually confused even what to eat. 95% of people have health problems with at least one third having five ailments. The reason this is happening is because in spite of all of this information, the forces in power, profit and control, don't look at the whole problem, they look through ignorance and you get confused. And because of this confusion, you get desperate, you get complacent, can you, yeah. Or you get divided into left and right, okay? Um, so um, you get divided into left and right, meaning you, you vote for this party or that party, but because people do not understand how to look at this information, that's what's happening. And those in power use a very specific way of keeping you in ignorance, not by the obvious establishment, but they have these fake gurus and they have Trumps and they have AOCs and they have Bernie Sanders, they have Tucker Carlson, Tucker Carlson's or Joe Rogan's or these people who are entertainers. These people do not lead you to wisdom. They keep you entertained. The only way out of this is to understanding how things are interconnected. And that is through knowledge. And knowledge is different than information. It's the ability to see the interconnections. And why is that important? Because you get wise. And why is wisdom important? Because when you have wisdom, you start seeing the world where you become an agent of change. You get empowered, you get active, you get innovative, you get organized. And when that happens, you have to be ready, ready to let go of the old system. You have to start asking very powerful new questions. Not like, oh, Dr. Shiva, how are you going to become more visible? No, how are you going to help us become more visible? And in order to do that, we have created the infrastructure to catalyze that. And that is a truth for the health system. 
What does that involve? Well, number one, it involves the fundamental course, foundations of systems. It took me 40, 50 years to develop this, but you will understand the same stuff I used to teach to MIT people, but I've made it easy, accessible. So in three hours, you can learn all this. You will understand what a system is. You will understand the nine principles of all systems. You will understand that these principles can be used for your health, for politics, for your freedom, for science, everything. It's truly the science of everything. I, you don't have to go buy these books. It's all included. You'll understand what is a system, why we need a revolution. What is a revolution? You will then understand that these fundamental principles of systems span Eastern systems of medicine, as well as engineering system science. But one of the things I'm very proud of is I've created a tool where you ask a certain set of questions. You'll find out what kind of system you are, denoted by this red dot. You'll find out when your system is off course, the black dot. And then you'll find out how you can become an alchemist to use foods and supplements to bring you back to you. So you're not following a diet, you're finding out what's right for you. The Cytosolve Open Science Institute relationship helps us teach you how food is medicine. Every once, every two months, I do special lectures from a systems approach. A couple of months ago, we did the lecture on teaching you how to meditate. You don't have to pay some guru and bow down to him for nothing. You, we taught you a very powerful way to meditate. Meditation is important to your entire body. Then I give you tools where you can teach this to your citizens. This is learn, teach, and serve. I do these one-on-ones, these town halls. And then we've created a warrior scholar global community. This is not, you have to feel alone, oh, woe is me. We have an incredible community of people. And then I want you to get on the ground. I want you not to say, oh, what, what can you do to get on this TV show? We don't measure our success by being on Fucker Carlson's show. We measure our success by how many leaflets that you hand out. Are you on the ground? And we make those, you have amazing leaflets to teach people on elections or vaccines or how to eat better. And then we've created our own tools, an equivalent of Twitter, an equivalent of Facebook and an equivalent of YouTube. So all of this is here for you. And that's the tools that we've created. So for God's sake, recognize that all of these are awaiting you. So go to truthfreedomhealth.com, become a warrior scholar, support the campaign, get on the ground. And my request is 20 minutes a day, 2% of your life. If you do for this, we're gonna radically change yourself and the world. All right, everyone, please town hall people, uh, please stay on. And I wish everyone on uh, social media world, uh, good evening, uh, be well, be the light. And we'll finish up here locally uh, in our town hall by introducing uh, in our uh, Truth for the Health call. Thank you, the town hall is officially over. Thank you. Who would have ever thought I'd be running for president of the United States of America? I was born a low caste untouchable in India's caste system, a system of aristocracy, oppression, and racism. My name is Dr. Shiva Ayadure. I'm an MIT PhD, a Fulbright scholar, a scientist, engineer, entrepreneur, and inventor. My family and I left India to come to America on my seventh birthday. I grew up in the working class neighborhoods of New Jersey, playing baseball, mowing lawns, painting houses, and coding software. My friends and neighbors are blacks, Italians, Irish, people of all races. As a 14-year-old, I wrote 50,000 lines of software code to create the world's first email system and was awarded the first U.S. copyright for email, recognizing me as its official inventor at a time when copyright was the only way to protect software inventions. I did that long before I ever came to MIT, revealing that big innovations can occur anytime, any place, by anybody. Growing up, I saw politicians dividing us by race and religion in both America and India to have us fighting each other while they remain safe in their gated communities and in their playgrounds of Hollywood, Martha's Vineyard, and Silicon Valley. I'm a fighter. I fought racism and exposed their imperialist wars, fought for workers, and put my life on the line against global corruption. I never wanted to run for political office. All that changed when I saw working Americans as never before being duped by the establishment and the not-so-obvious establishment. Across left and right, we were being sold out and made to forget why we came to America and why America existed. Lawyers, academics, billionaires, celebrities and politicians, elites, Clintons, Kennedys, Bidens, Obamas, Bushes, black and white have hijacked America. They printed trillions for their friends. They delivered crumbling infrastructure, corruption and racism. They transferred trillions to themselves, dividing black and white, fear-mongering and fake science. Lockdowns and censorship, dirty air, food and water, pushing drugs upon us, making us sicker. We've been sold out. One set of rules for them and another for us. We deserve a warrior with a history of courage in putting everything on the line for you, 
who believes in you, not them, who has created a movement bottoms up for truth, freedom, health. I've exposed their lies at the right time, never waiting until it was popular. I've exposed their false gods who exist to lead you back to them. I've exposed their fake science of lockdowns and masking and provided you solutions to fight them and win and protect your immune system, saving millions. I exposed Fauci, galvanized the fire Fauci campaign when others remained silent. When they stole our election, we sued the government and Twitter in our historic 2020 federal lawsuit, exposing in bare view the government and big tech censorship infrastructure, the unholy alliance between government and social media companies. Where was Elon and his grifters? They stood by the sidelines and did nothing. They did not use their megaphones to help us when it could have made a big difference. Now our movement grows for truth, freedom, health, independent of all of them. Every day millions are learning the science of systems, the knowledge the elites do not want you to have, so you may learn how to think, stand up, and fight, independent of the establishment of left and right and their fake heroes. Now it's time for you to join the movement, to win back America, to win back truth, win back freedom, win back your health. That's why I'm running for President of the United States. This race is about you. This race is about truth, freedom, health versus power, profit, control. We've had enough. They think we'll fall in line and vote again for their lawyers, celebrities, billionaires, and chosen ones from above. We choose our heroes from below, from the rank and file who do what is right at the right time, not when it's convenient and popular. They can never represent us. What America needs is a movement by the working people for the working people who are educated, organized, decentralized, and fight for independence from their systems of control. And that movement exists. It's ready for you. We don't need them. We need us to go bottoms up, neighbor to neighbor. My journey, your journey are all the same. It's our time. It's time we had one of us. It's time to win back truth, freedom, health, to win back America, be part of this historic movement all the way to our victory on November 5th, 2024. If you're an American citizen, pledge your vote now for Dr. Shivaya Dure, the independent candidate for U.S. president. No matter where you live, you can be a part of this. Volunteer as little as 20 minutes a day. Don't delay. This is Dr. Shivaya Dure, and I approve this message paid for by Dr. Shiva for president.